All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, to learn more about the investigation stage of planning a youth-led service project. Um, for those of you who don't know, and also it doesn't say this correctly on the sidebar, but my name is Sarah Berry, um, and I'm YSA's Grants Manager. Um, and before we get started, I just want to uh, note that you should have a go-to webinar panel on the side of your screen. Um, if at any point you have a question for me or for any of our guest presenters, um, or if something isn't working correctly, feel free to just type the questions into the chat or questions box on the side. Um, we're going to have a few minutes after each presenter for questions, so feel free to submit them throughout and we'll scan through them. Um, and we're also going to take all of the questions afterwards and compile a list for our presenters as well. So um, feel free at any point to uh, type in a question there or let us know if anything isn't working for you. Um, but tonight, we will hear from three experts, all of whom who have experience working with youth to create and implement service projects. From these varying perspectives, we hope that you will walk away from this webinar with a better understanding of how to get started on your service project and how to engage other youth or just youth in general in your project. Um, we will hear from Matthew, who is a YSA grantee, and he currently serves on YSA's Global Youth Council. Then we'll hear from Rachel, who is a third grade teacher and also a YSA grantee, and she will talk about her experience engaging students in investigating a problem in her community. And finally, we'll hear from Marcella, who is from Hands On Bogota um, in Colombia, and we'll hear from her about an international perspective and, a not, and her experience as a nonprofit professional about working with youth to identify issues in her community and how they plan to overcome those um, particular issues. So thank you again for everyone for joining us, and here we go. Um, before I pass it on over to our panelists for the evening, I just want to quickly talk about what investigation means and the importance of it. First of all, what does investigation mean? Uh, one of the most important parts, not only of investigation, but of creating service projects in general, is making sure that the issue is important to you or to the youth that you're working with. Um, it is imperative that you want to fix the issue that you're working on, so you, it should be something that is important to you and to those that you are working with as well. As part of your investigation, you and your team will do research about the needs in your community surrounding that issue and what the problems connected to that issue area are. Next, you'll need to brainstorm ways to address the, address the need and make an impact. From there, you can then choose a meaningful, doable, and effective project to address that issue, and then you can move on to planning and preparing your project. Um, the investigation stage is actually one of the most important stages of creating and implementing your service project because before you can plan your project, you have to become an expert on the issue area and you have to get smart about the issue. It's combining your head with your heart, your passions with your research. It's also important to understand what has already been done and how you can add value to current efforts focused on that same issue area in your community. Does it make more sense to start your own project or to support and volunteer your time towards a project that's already created? This stage will help you meet like-minded partners and champions for change within the issue area, and then you can work together to persuade others to get involved in your projects and in your efforts. Hopefully, now you understand the importance of investigation just from this brief overview, um, and at the end we'll actually go over some resources to help you understand a little bit more, but hopefully you understand the importance of it, and hopefully this will help you to create a foundation for the rest of your project. Uh, here you will see an example of a student who came up with a project to address environmental issues in his community. As you can see, this person was inspired by their classmates and by seeing them recycle. From there, he came up with a vision for his school to promote respect for the environment. After this step, this student will go on to plan and prepare a project. So when you're thinking about these things as you're you know, listening to the rest of this presentation, feel free to take a step back and look at this small example. It's very minimal, but they were inspired by something and chose to focus their project on that issue area because of their inspiration of it. Now, um, I'm going to actually pass it over to Matthew, who will talk about his own nonprofit and some best practices he has for the investigation stage. So, Matthew, you should be able to go ahead. All right. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Matthew Kaplan. I'm a high school senior in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm also the founder of the B1 Project, which is a community building and anti-bullying nonprofit, specifically for middle school students. And I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about how I took my idea for the B1 project 
and turned it into action. You know, a lot of times it can be daunting, especially for young people, to decide that they want to help make the world a better place. But it is possible. So this evening, I, as Sarah said, plan to share some strategies and best practices for how to create meaningful service projects. So in my mind, if I can get this slide to change, perfect. So the first step is in, is the first step is to creating a service project is to think about what community issue it is that you want to help solve. And to do that, I want you to brainstorm the ways that you can use your interests, your skills, and your talents to make a difference. You know, if you have a passion for, um, say, science, maybe you should consider environmental advocacy. Or perhaps you have an interest in the arts. Perhaps you could provide after-school arts programming to underserved youth. You know, your interests can be as broad as working to combat homelessness and poverty to as specific as advocating for the orangutans in Borneo. But what I want you to do is really take the time to think about what issues move you, and then to consider approaches that will allow you to use your talents to, to help other people. You know, it's so important that you have a genuine interest in your field because passion is infectious. You know, if you love what you do, others will join you. You know, a lot of times people ask me how I got involved in bullying, but bullying wasn't always my passion. I actually sort of stumbled onto this subject when my younger brother became the victim of bullying at our middle school. You know, all I wanted was for somebody to do something about it, and then I realized that that somebody had to be me. So I took action, and I created the Be One Project. When I began the Be One Project, I didn't have any special knowledge or special skills. I just saw a problem that I thought that I could solve, and I found a way to make a difference. So don't underestimate your own power. Remember that there's no secret recipe for making a difference in your community. You will find, as I did, that once people see you being the change that you want to see, they will join you. You know, if I had known four years ago that the B1 project would be as big as it is today, I probably never would have started. It would have seemed too overwhelming. But as young people, we often have innovative approaches. We don't see risk, so we're not afraid of taking them. We don't see obstacles as insurmountable, so we're not afraid to try. We have the unique ability to connect with other youth as peers. And believe it or not, people listen when we speak and when we tell people what we know and what we've done. You know, I've been able to talk to senators, CEOs, and celebrities and they look to me as an expert in my field of bullying. And they'll look to you as an expert in your field. So believe in yourself. But also, never be afraid to ask for help. Because you'll make mistakes as you go. I know that I did. But you're not alone. Because there are organizations like Youth Service America that offer grants and programs and resources to really help you get started and to find where you are in the investigation stage. You don't need anything more than an idea to make a difference and to begin planning a meaningful project. So when thinking about investigation, adopt a dream big, act small mindset. Have that vision for what it is that you're wanting your community to look like. And then start small. You know, when I did my first program, it was only for 50 kids, just my brother's classroom. I never imagined that it would grow into what it has. But through those small steps that I've taken, it has grown. And I know that your projects will grow too. I think that C. Jobs really put it best when he said that the people who think that they are crazy enough to change the world are the ones who do. Call me crazy, but I believe that we all have the power to make a difference. I created the B1 project. And we have been able to reach over 2,500 students in four states. What will you do? It seems like my time has come to an end. I know we have a bunch of incredible presenters following me. And I know I'll have a few minutes to answer some questions. But if I don't get to your question or something comes up afterwards, please feel free to email me whether you need advice 
or you have a project specific question, definitely reach out. Um, I would love to help. My email is, as you can see on the slide, matthew at the b one projectorg or you can go to my website at the b one projectorg and you can send me a message there. So again, if you have any questions about how to you know, take an idea and to implement it, definitely reach out. I would love to help you in any way that I can. All right, Sarah, I'm going to pass it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, we're going to pause here um, and take a couple of questions. Um, so if you do have a question for Matthew, feel free to just type it in the questions box. Um, and we will um, answer a couple questions and then move right along. So um, first question, Matthew, um, is what is one way to find other kids who are interested in the same issues as you, and how can you uh, come up with a project together? That's a really great question, and I think for me with the B1 project, finding partners is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've done, I've done a few different things, is you know look at your school. Find kids who have you know, an interest in social justice and human rights, and see if they share your passions. And I think the easiest way to do that is to tell people what it is that you're passionate about. If you don't share what it is that you care about, no one will be able to know, and they won't be able to you know, latch on to that idea. Another way is there are a bunch of um, organizations and um, kind of cohorts of people that if you, you can apply to these programs, such as 3 Dot Dash, um, Peace First, the NCAM program with YSA, and they're filled with people that are interested in you know, making their community a better place. So lots of opportunities that way to find like-minded people. Awesome, great. Um, and one question actually from Stephen, who was an NCAM ambassador with you last year. He, oh yeah, hi Stephen. <laughs> his question is, does the B1 project use a national model or have you created your own original program? So the B1 project, we, I have my own programming, so everything that we do is geared specifically towards middle school students. You know, a lot of the programs out there are for high schoolers, mm -hmm. so what we've done is create a unique program for middle school students. And in terms of our model, right now we operate on a more local level, so we have programs that we do all across Arizona. Eventually we're going to branch off so we'll have regional um, coordinators. So in every region we'll have someone that can um, go out and present programs, as well as people that will be able to train and mentor program presenters. So we're operating both, you know, on the national level, but also locally here back home in Arizona. Great. Awesome. And I'll just give you sort of one last question. And like I said, yeah, sounds good. we'll take the rest of the questions and share them with you to answer later. But um, this is from Mark, and he says, you said that you reached out for help. What is the best piece of advice or assistance or help that you received along your journey to the development of the B1 project? I think one of the things that has really helped me along the way is to make sure that throughout all of it that someone told me to stay true to who you are and to the mission that you're wanting to strive for. And I think a lot of times, you know, I at least struggle school, I juggle lots of things in my life, and just staying true to that mission, that vision, I think really kind of cements you and grounds you in what it is that you're doing. And I think also finding ways to celebrate the work that you do. I mean, sometimes service can be thankless, you know, even though it's very selfless when you're giving back to others. So finding those moments for celebration and to really revel in the success. You know, make sure that you're taking time to um, cheer, pat yourself on the back and give yourself a job well done. Great. Thank you so much, Matthew. And just um, for everyone out there listening, also feel free to submit questions via Twitter. Um, feel free to just um, tweet them at Youth Service, um, and we'll hopefully have time to answer those, or if not, like I said, answer them at a later time. So um, feel free to do that, as well as you know, tweet at our presenters. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and meet you again, Matthew. And now I'm going to uh, pass it over to Rachel, who is going to talk about her experience working with students as a third grade teacher. So, Rachel, you should be able to uh, go ahead. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm a third grade teacher. And um, Matthew, I really liked everything that you had to say, and it inspires me as a teacher 
um, that we have so many high school youth working the way that you do. But um, I am lucky enough to kind of have a captive audience in, in who I'm working with. Um, one thing I agree with that Matthew said is that um, you can make a difference no matter who, never underestimate your ability to make a difference. And I think that's what I taught the eight-year-olds that I work with when we did our hunger project. And Sarah, I can't seem to change the slide. Oh, yeah. oh wait. I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, I did it. I think I skipped a slide. Can we go back? Yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, great. Um, so one of the things that I do with little kids, and you could do this with teenagers, you could do this with adults, is just begin with um, what are you interested in? We had an issue to deal with in my classroom, and we just began with a story, and we talked about it. Um, but one of the things that I think a lot of people miss out on because they get so excited about their cause is just to have a conversation. What do you know? Um, what are the misconceptions? What are your ideas on how we can help? And when I'm working with third graders, you know, in the beginning they said, we're, we're, um, this is way too big of a problem for us to help with. So what I did was just starting, we just, we had the conversation and then we started doing a little bit of research. And we brought in, I think on the slide it says introduce primary sources. So we brought in some guest speakers. And whether you're working with Matthew's group or you're working with an older group or you're working with little kids, if you can get some people who are experts in to talk to you, that will help quite a bit. See those cute kids? We're looking up information right there. And one of the things that I did for little kids was I compiled um, places for them to go so that they weren't randomly searching. So um, if you're the leader, like Matthew was his, with his bullying project or whatever project you're doing, if you want your audience to go where you're going, you kind of have to give them a little um, push in that direction. You kind of have to give them some, um, you know, some background knowledge. And then that will help them build up their, what they want to do. Oh, I can't get it to go. So one of the things I did, well, I missed the map. Oh, let's see. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> one of the things I did was, um, you know, provided them with the information. And then we were lucky enough to have YSA come out and interview. And for the group of children that I, the group that I'm dealing with, little kids, one of the most important aspects of this whole project was reflection. Okay, what did we think at the beginning? What do we think now? What have we learned? Have we changed our mind? So for us, and probably even for Matthew's group, what did we think when we were going into this? What do we think now? And how can we help? Um, the picture that's on the screen now, when we started, we had this issue of what is childhood hunger? And we researched it, we read stories about it, we had conversations, lots and lots of misconceptions, and lots of little kids saying there's nothing we can do in our state to help childhood hunger. By the end of, we did a lot of investigation. We spent probably four months investigating the issue. And that's another important idea to bring up, is you can't just have an issue and take action you have to go through the investigation stage. And sometimes if you're older, maybe it's two weeks or a month, but for, for little ones, it took us four months to investigate the issue of childhood hunger, find out what it is, find out what the issues were and how we could possibly help, and then start taking action that way. So the investigation took us quite a while. So we, we did some research. We researched online. We had tons and tons of guest speakers come in. And then by the end of this, the picture that you're seeing now, which they all look so incredibly happy, um, our action that we took after all of those months of investigating the issue was having a rally at our state capitol um, to, get the, to get a breakfast bill passed. And what you're seeing there is a senator from the state capitol. And, um, we were fortunate enough that that bill passed on the day that we were there, and the senator is coming out and supporting all of the kids. So that's, you know, a very civic lesson that they're learning early on. And when they get to be Matthew's age, all of these kids that you see in the picture are probably going to be leaders 
in their own in their own projects. Like they because they did all of the investigation up front and then because they took action in their hearts they feel like they can make a difference. So all of you that are listening and that are in this service learning thing that we do, you make a difference. You make a huge difference whether you think you do or not. And I think that was probably my last slide. I clicked through a bunch of them pretty quickly. Um, like I said, I'm a teacher. I'm used to answering questions all day, every day. So feel free to reach out to me. And um, right now I'm available for questions. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Like, like she said, feel free to uh, shoot your questions over um, in the same questions box. And um, we'll go ahead and answer some questions. Uh, the first question we have for you, Rachel, is uh, fostering a strong partnership between a school and a community partner can be difficult. Do you have any experience with this? And um, either way, do you have, if you've had experience with it, do you have advice for doing so? Or if not, um, any thoughts on that? Oh my gosh, I have tons and tons of experience in working with the community, and I have never had an issue when I've reached out to anybody in any project, and I've done over the years, tons of service projects ranging from water to hunger, everything you can think of. Um, my experience is anytime I've reached out to the community, they have been more than willing to come to our school or to do a Skype. We've done national Skypes. It just it seems like the community is dying to get into the school system. So maybe I'm fortunate in that arena. But even when even out of the school, when I'm doing different service projects, you know, through my church or as an adult, I find that the community, the businesses, really want to get involved. And especially if it's a nonprofit, they're looking for some backup. So they they readily share their resources. Great, that's awesome. Great advice. Um, looks like we've just got one other question here. Um, how did you go about picking childhood hunger as the issue that you and your classroom would focus on? Um, and how did you get those children to be um, inspired by that issue and by other projects? That is a great question. I personally am very passionate about childhood hunger as a person who grew up hungry. Mm -hmm. But for this particular project, I had gotten a grant from YSA for specifically focusing on child childhood hunger through SEDEXO and YSA. Um, my kids were not all interested in the beginning. I'm going to be honest about that. But what we did is we had a lot of conversations, and I never told them what to think. I let them think what they were thinking until they learned differently. So they might have had the misconception that all hungry people are lazy. I didn't tell them that wasn't the case. We did research, and they discovered differently. And the more we researched and the more we talked to, to the community, the more their passion built. I didn't have to build it for them. It, it came naturally. Great. That's awesome. And um, I think we'll move on from there. But like I said, we'll answer any other questions. Um, we'll have Rachel answer them at a later time. So thank you so much, Rachel. I'm going to go ahead and mute you now. And uh, lastly, I'm going to pass it over to Marcella, who is going to talk about the investigation stage from an organization's perspective. So. Marcella, you should be all set to go. Absolutely. Good evening, everybody. Um, I won't speak in Spanish, I promise, although <laughs> I'm sure there are many Spanish speakers out there. Um, so my name is Marcella, and I li currently live in Colombia, where I founded and lead a nonprofit organization. Well, we're a volunteer organization, basically. We put people at the center of change and try to connect them to their power of making a difference through service, service leadership, their passion, and their innovation. These are all words that we've just heard both Matthew and Rachel uh, mention, and they're, they're critical to getting people involved, especially youth engaged, uh, and having them become lifelong citizens of service and, and volunteering in our communities. Um, so this is basically the mission of our organization. What we try to do is inspire citizens, inspire youth towards their civic responsibilities, equip them with the necessary tools, and then mobilize them to, to generate a positive, positive change within their communities. Um, so for us, what we try to do is putting youth together with activities and 
and causes that interest them and impact them, I'm not able to move this either. Hold on. <laughs> One, oh, there we go. So there we go. Yep. Got it. Yes. Um, so what we, for us, um, really it's just a question of asking. So when we meet, uh, particularly the past two years that we've been operational here in, in Bogota, Colombia, um, we've been working especially with one international school that is very particular in that it, it's located in a, in a difficult uh, community um, and it has the neighboring areas uh, are some of the communities that served, that the students actually serve and try to support. There's a sister school to this international school which offers uh, a perfect place for our students to really give back to their neighbors and to their uh, communities. So what we've done with the students uh, is basically ask them. <laughs> Unfortunately, and this happens to me as a mother and, and I know that it happens to me as, as a leader in, in service with youth, is we sometimes don't ask kids and youth what they're interested in, what they think about certain topics, about certain causes. Uh, what they would like to do and get them to brainstorm and get them to give us some ideas. Honestly, the things they come up with are absolutely amazing, inspiring, and will definitely surprise everyone. So the method that we that has been very useful to us has been the surveys, basically because you can do either printed versions of it or you can do online versions. Um, so digital, which, which is very practical when you're trying to, to gather information from a large community. Um, so what we've done is basically send out surveys and have youth, high schoolers uh, and middle schoolers answer some questions and, and honestly, they, it really is uh, um, very, very useful for the next steps. So the first step, this, uh, the research that comes into the planning, we have to make sure that children and youth, they realize that a service project and being active in the community, it's not just the actual day that they go and participate and, and it's not the action day, but it involves also the planning stage, the actual action, <laughs> and then the reflection that, that Rachel was talking about. The reflection is critical for these young citizens to become lifelong individuals and citizens in their communities. What we've, let me see if I can get it to go. There we go. Um, what this allows for is basically empowering kids. Honestly, um, again, as adults, sometimes we underestimate. It's another word that we heard, I don't know if it was Matthew or Rachel use. We cannot underestimate the ability, the project management ability <laughs> that kids and youth have. Um, they are incredibly capable and much more so than many times we, we, we realize. So empowering kids to take charge and lead the programs, it really does offer the program some continuity um, because they're excited and they're passionate and, it's, and it really, having done the research through the surveys, we're able to see what their interests are and that ultimately empowers them and then offers that continu to continuity for the programs. In our personal, our experience here at Hands On, um, when we did the, a survey to a group of high schoolers, um, we were able to develop an after school and extracurricular school clubs to the sister school. And it was truly amazing the interests and the passions that these students have and that wanted to offer the community served, um, but at the same time you need to make sure that the community served is recipient to that, is open to that. So what we did is we actually surveyed, and this all comes back to the, the, the research, the previous, the research that we need to do to identify community issues. Um, we, re we, we did a survey also to the community served. So to the sister school we also surveyed the students and asked them what they would like. So these are students that come from very difficult neighborhoods um, and that need these after school activities obviously to stay out of trouble. Um, but it wasn't just a question of what the kids from the international school could, could offer them. It was what they wanted to receive. 
Um, so it was amazing to really see that uh, that connection there and see where they where they met and what uh, could benefit both parties, both both the volunteers and the community served. Um, some of the results. Uh, we also brought this program down to middle school. Like Matthew mentioned, usually many programs are sometimes geared to, uh, to high schoolers. So we brought down a community service program to middle school. And they were basically, each grade level was offered a different uh, action cause, action area. And the students were allowed to kind of go wild and free and kind of brainstorm and, and just move along and move forward and, and, and lead their own projects. They did some amazing things with some guidance from adults. But honestly, um, they, did, they fundraised for an entire surgery of Operation Smile Child. They made a very professional institutional video for a nonprofit which I mean you could honestly it was just professional it was just it was just, it was edited and the music and everything I mean it was just as 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 professional as if that nonprofit would have hired an agency to make the video they they had a newspaper drive for an animal shelter they made an environmental awareness campaign throughout the school they did a toy drive for all the children at the at operation smile as well they made a dollhouse out of recycled material for a medical center. They actually made a, a quilt for one of the girls that underwent an operation through Operation Smile. They each made a quilt patch and then they assembled it and built an entire quilt for her. So these are very meaningful projects that, again, they will never forget and that will ensure that they are lifelong active citizens in their communities. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, I think that's about it. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and take the keyboard and uh, again, Here. like we did with everyone else, There's my, uh, yes. we're going to answer some questions, so uh, feel free to type them in. Um, the first question we have for you, Marcella, is do you suggest only having one adult involved in a student's project or more than one? And what are the benefits if there's more than one? Um, honestly, the amount of adult supervision and guidance and, and, and leading that you need, it really depends on several factors. I would say the scope of the project, the action area, the actual students. I mean, the age of the students uh, is, is critical. Um, obviously, at, at Rachel's uh, classroom age of eight-year-olds, you definitely need a, need a bit more guidance. And for older students, you wouldn't need to, you know, kind of offer them a, a listing of online um, online sources for the research. I mean, also it depends on the actual adults that are going that are supervising and that are leading. I mean, what type of experience they have leading service projects. Um, leading a service project, it requires a, a, a set of, of abilities and skills, and it really depends. We had parents help some of the activities, obviously, when students need to, you know, the transportation, so parents need to take charge there. Um, but it really depends on the, on the type of project. It's just flexible, I'd say. Sure, absolutely. And we've got a couple questions about the survey. So um, first of all, uh, what type of questions did you ask? And second of all, would you be willing to share an example of that so that um, people could see sort of what that looked like and use it as an example for their own projects? Absolutely, yes. I can send, I can, if I can send it to you, Sarah, and then I suppose you can, you can send it out to everybody. Absolutely. The couple that we have, um, they're in Spanish, though, I must say. Okay. <laughs> so I'll work on those and I'll get them out to everybody, no problem. They're very brief. I mean, that's really critical. Yeah. I mean, I am no expert in putting surveys together, but what I do know is that if it's long, nobody will ever answer, and especially students and youth. So what we do is we keep it to a minimum between five and ten. Even ten questions is way too much, honestly. I would say up to five. Um, and, and, and to get an idea of, of where they are. And then it allows, obviously, for, for, for follow-ups. Uh, once students see that you do a survey, and this is critical to me, if you actually survey 
a group of students, a community, whoever it may be, you have to be willing to put into practice those results. So they have to see, <laughs> whoever answered those questions have to see that something was done with the responses. And I think that is very important because many times we answer questions, you know, surveys, and then you think they're just, they're just, you know, kept in a pile on someone's desk. And that can't be the case. You can actually make a small, um, just a summary of what the findings were and share that with them. And then let them know what the follow-up will be to those uh, survey results. Sure, absolutely. And I'll just ask you one final question and then we'll send you the rest later. Um, do you have any advice for, um, or advice for adults to help them give up control when they're working with youth? And also, can you comment on if it's okay for adults um, to give up control even if the youth don't meet some sort of expectation because it is a learning process? Yes, I think this, uh, I'm going to give an example. Um, we're leading, it's not necessarily youth, but it, it's a group of very, very young professionals. We have a service project that we've been managing for some time, mm -hmm. and we were managing it directly. Um, and I must say, we, we saw that it was kind of, um, I don't know, the interest was kind of, of, of not at high, as high as we would have liked. And all of a sudden, when we as an organization kind of mentioned to the group of volunteers that we were taking a step back, we simply, we're still a very young organization, so obviously our manpower is limited. We said, look, we really, we just don't have the time to manage this project. Um, we're not sure where this is going to go. These group of volunteers, they've literally <laughs> lifted this project off the ground, and now it's like the super project for Hands on Bogota. I mean, they have, they have gathered, they have put together a group of very talented volunteers and they, and they just take charge. So I think that once you're willing to kind of take that risk and step back a little bit, you'll see that be it youth or, or even young professionals or any older volunteer as well, they will take charge. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and um, mute you again. But... Um, before we go on to sort of some next steps and resources that everyone can use, I first just want to say thank you so much to Matthew, Rachel, and Marcella. I know that I personally have learned a ton from, you know, just listening to your experiences and how you engage youth in your projects. So um, I know I'm not the only one that, you know, thanks you so much for being here and for sharing your exp expertise with us. Um, but now that we've heard from the experts, I'm sure that everyone on this webinar is sort of wondering, okay, well, what's next? Um, so you should take all of the information that was just presented to you from our presenters and from some of the resources they mentioned um, and their best practices and bring them back to your school, bring them back to your group, bring them back to your community and begin that research. Um, begin to gauge interest in the community issue and begin to investigate the issue, the community issue. Um, I know that all three of them highlighted that investigation is a very important stage in planning your project. If you don't start to investigate and research and see and engage interest in your community for the issue area that you're focused on, then you can't really take those next steps. Um, but after you do that, after you bring back um, your research and gauge interest in your community, you'll want to begin to plan and prepare for your service project. Um, so that's sort of the next step, which we can talk about at a later date. But um, also make sure that you're engaging other volunteers and other youth in your project. Um, you're not, you're definitely and certainly not the only one um, in your community who's interested in a certain issue area or is passionate about something um, within your community. So reach out to other people, reach out to other youth, reach out to other adult mentors or organizations. Um, feel free to reach out to me and people at YSA as well as our three presenters here tonight. Um, we're all here as champions for you and your projects. Um, and lastly, I just want to say, make sure you ask questions. I know Matthew highlighted that in, in his portion, saying that never be afraid to ask questions. We're not, no one is expecting you to be you know, an expert in your issue area, especially at the beginning. So feel free to ask questions of other people, of other volunteers, of organizations who might be focused on the same issue area as you. Um, and from there, you can continue to investigate and then begin to plan and prepare. Um, I wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about some resources that uh, YSA offers, which um, might be helpful to you. And certainly, um, we encourage you to take a look at them and 
look through their pages and let us know if you have any questions. Um, I thought I'd highlight sort of three of the resources that would be most helpful for you during the investigation stage. Um, the first being Youth Changing the World, um, which is on our resources page at www.ysa.org backslash resources. Um, there is a sort of a step-by-step -step guide on th questions you should be asking yourself and ways to start your service project. Um, so I definitely encourage you, if you're sort of starting from scratch, I would definitely take a look at that. Um, there's also the Semester of Service Strategy Guide, um, which is more focused for um, so for projects that will take place over the course of a school semester. Um, definitely useful for teachers as well as students who um, are working with schools um, and things like that. As well as the Kids in Action Guide. Um, definitely a very helpful resource. Um, and I want to highlight one more that actually is not on this page, um, which um, is called Classrooms with a Cause. Excuse me. Um, and that is more focused um, for the classroom, similar to the way the semester of service is organized. However, um, I definitely encourage you to take a look at it, um, and you can sort of change it around your own issue area and the people that you're working with. Um, and so definitely take a look at that. It's adaptable to your own projects. Um, again, Classrooms with Cause can be found on the same page as all of these resources here. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you to Marcella, Matthew, and Rachel. I know that we really appreciate hearing from you. And all of our people listening in tonight are really appreciative of your expertise and help. Um, I'm going to, uh, this video actually has been recorded. So I will um, be sure to upload that um, as well as some, with some answers to the remaining questions um, up to uh, the YSA page. Um, and I'll be sure to um, let you guys know when that's up and um, up and running for you to take a look at or if you want to share it out with other people who might not have been um, able to join us tonight. Um, but if you do have any further questions, um, the email addresses of the presenters were on the slides. However, my email address is up here on the screen as well. Um, if you didn't catch their email addresses, feel free to email me. It's sberry at ysa.org. Um, and I'd be happy to either answer your questions directly or um, pass them over to any of our presenters as well. Um, and if you have any questions about our website or resources on our website, um, feel free to let me know. Um, I encourage you all to browse the website. Look at the resources we offer. Um, look at the websites of um, our presenters here. So I'm sure they have some great information on there as well. So thank you again to our three presenters and to all of you for listening in. And I'm looking very much forward to hearing more from all of you about investigating issues in your own communities. So with that, thank you and good night.